Okay, ladies and gentlemen, two o'clock. Welcome back to ME 2001, AKA your favorite class. All right, new topic today, but not really that new because you already basically know how to do it. Um, so today we're gonna talk about 3D rigid body equilibrium. Uh, I posted a set of notes and I thought I had posted it earlier this morning, um, but I mistaken. So I only recently posted the notes maybe about 15 minutes ago. So apologies for that, but notes on 3D rigid body equilibrium are now available on Canvas. <clears throat> and um, that's what we're gonna be going over today. Okay, a couple of other announcements is that uh, your next homework is posted. So that's homework number five. That's on 2D and 3D rigid body equilibrium. So pretty much after today, definitely after tomorrow, you should be able to make your way through pretty much the entire homework. So uh, no excuse for not kind of getting moving on it uh, this weekend, right? So do that. It's going to be due on Wednesday of next week. Another announcement is that you have your second exam for this class next Friday. So keep that on the radar. I will probably make some practice problems sometime this weekend and release them on Canvas. And then I think we'll have a review session maybe Thursday night. More information on that to to come uh, probably this weekend by email. OK, so look for that. All right, how do we like the mean today? Um, <laughs> I guess we don't really have in person exams these days, but uh, this one always got me when I was you know taking classes in person. Guys, please make sure you read the question carefully. <laughs> got that over your shoulder. You're like, oh, uh, I think maybe I messed up. Uh, yeah, OK, so I like this meme. It's funny, very relevant. All right, so let's get into it. <clears throat> I think I'm going to actually stay off the writing pad today, and I think I'll actually just talk over the 3D rigid body equilibrium slides because, to be honest, there's not a lot of information here that you don't already know. So 3D rigid body equilibrium, this is going to be more or less the same thing that we've sort of been doing with 2D, except now we're going to expand it to 3D. And I've sort of talked about the difference between 2D and 3D already, but um, basically in 3D, you know, for equilibrium, we have three equations that we can use. If we're in the XY plane, that is some of the forces in X, some of the forces in Y both equal to zero, as well as some of the moments in Z equal zero. So we've sort of talked about that and be beaten that to death with example problems and sort of the lecture that we had earlier this week. Okay, now we're going to the next level, all the way 3D. And here now we have six equations that we can use. Some of the forces X, some of the forces Y, some of the forces Z equals zero. Some of the moments X, some of the moments Y, some of the moments Z equals zero. Um, I make a note here about one point only. Um, good idea and a good practice to just sum the moments about one particular point on your body. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. Now with 2D, remember we had that chart that showed all the reaction forces, like how many forces are associated with a pin, how many forces are associated with a built-in end? How many reaction forces are associated with a rough surface? All those sorts of things, okay? And, you know, Paige asked me, do we have to have those memorized? Well, I guess not, not necessarily, but it would help you if you did. We have a very similar idea when we go to 3D, is that when you have various boundary conditions, let's say a roller in 3D or a bearing or all sorts of different boundary conditions, you're going to have resistance to motion from each of those individual components. If you have a bearing, if you have a built-in end, if you have a ball and socket joint, if you have a universal joint, they all have different restrictions that they put on how your rigid body can either move or rotate. And if your boundary condition is restricting that motion or that angular motion or that linear motion, you have to sort of account for the force or the moment that would restrict that motion. And so here we show a, another chart that's very similar to the one that we showed for 2D when you're thinking about how are these boundary conditions limiting my motion and what forces and moments do I need to accommodate if I have or I'm breaking away those boundaries. All right, so as I move and draw my 3D free body diagrams, I'm going to have to consider a lot more possible types of reactions now and what moments might be generated and what forces might be generated. Okay, so you typically, you know, you'll have your your same similar ones that you had in 2D, like a ball ball on the ground or a roller on the ground in a frictionless surface. Maybe this one's just providing you force or resisting your motion through the floor, so force just in one direction. A cable again, just to force in one direction. Here's a, 
<clears throat> sort of a roller on a rough surface is interesting. It restricts your motion in two directions. A wheel on a roll. Um, so this is, uh, again, restricting sort of your motion in and out of the plane here and up and down, but it would allow you to move sort of left and right in this particular image. And so it's only restricting you up and down and in and out of the plane here. So we see that with our free body diagram reaction forces and so on and so forth. Here's a ball and socket joint or a full rough surface only resisting you with forces. And then we get into sort of the interesting bits. And those are what sort of boundaries might create moments that we would have to consider or restrict angular motion. So a couple of um, couple of pieces that pretty pretty intuitive, at least should be intuitive. Um, I like to start maybe with um, the bearing down here. Um, so this bearing, I think it's sort of can be one of two ways. Either you have a bearing that allows you to move sort of in and out of what would be sort of like the, the slot of the bearing. Um, that would give you free motion in that general direction. But a lot of resistance of not only moving left and right, like I can't move this rod in this direction, I can't move the rod in this direction. And so we see forces here that are sort of stopping that motion. But also I'm, I wouldn't be able to rotate that rod, let's say about this uh, Y axis here. So this bearing here would restrict me from sort of twisting about that Y axis and sort of same thing about this, um, this other axis here. You know, I can't provide any twisting. I, that, that thing is not free to move in either one of those rotational senses. Um, it's, that's different from like this ball and socket joint. I'm free to rotate any direction that I want freely in that ball and socket joint. And so I wouldn't have any moments that restricted that particular angular motion. Okay, so take a look at this chart. You have a, a, another one that's similar to this in your book, and you can find these charts online. It's not that hard, but different boundary conditions will give you these different reaction forces and moments, and you have to be comfortable knowing what they are. All right. So our free body diagrams in 3D now are going to contain a lot of the same information, um, except we just have a little bit more complication because we're in 3D. So I give you some sort of questions about, you know, what body do I want to draw my free body diagram about? And did I properly represent everything cut away with appropriate forces and reactions, et cetera? So here is a space diagram that you might get at this particular point in the class. And you have to be able to convert that to a free body diagram, which is something like you see here with the various forces of, let's say, the cables here, the weight of the object. And this guy would be the reaction forces from a ball and socket joint here at point A is a ball and socket. All right, so last thing I want to say before we actually do an example problem is uh, a quick note on the directions of reaction forces. And I've sort of mentioned this before, but let's really hammer it home. And we'll say that typically the direction of the reaction forces is not known. So if you have a ball and socket joint or you have a pin or you have a roller or whatever, you might not necessarily know, okay, is the force associated with that going up or going down or left or right or what's generally the direction. Um, so the way that we handle that with our free body diagrams is we just draw it in the positive sense, right? Whether it's a force or a moment, draw it in the positive direction and let the math take you there. If you work the math and you calculate that that reaction force is in fact negative, well, then you drew it in the wrong direction to start with. And the force actually acts opposite of the way you drew or the moment is tending to cause rotation about the opposite direction um, that you calculated. OK, so that's it. That's pretty much everything for these notes. The next couple of days is just going to be example problems in 3D. So here we have an example problem, and it's basically the exact same free body diagram and example problem from a couple of slides ago. And we'll work fully through this problem and you'll see how sort of complicated, but not really that complicated. Some of these 3D equilibrium problems are. All right. So I'll give you maybe uh, I don't know, a minute or two to, to sort of copy everything down associated with this problem, and then we'll work our way through it.
I realize that I'm missing the word uh, like sign or something here. A five foot by eight foot sign with uniform density or plate or something, right? Something to indicate that it's an object. Whoops. And be particularly mindful here about this ball and socket joint idea here um, at A. This is going to be important in determining the reaction forces associated with point A. OK, maybe another 30 seconds. I know it's it's a little bit difficult to draw things in in 3D here, so do, do your best. All right, I'm going to copy the picture over here to the notes, and we'll we'll get into it. OK, so here we are with this particular example, and I'll just copy the information that was given by the problem. Uh, the weight of this thing given as 270 pounds, so that'll be important for us. Right. I want to find reactions at A. and the tensions in wires CE and BD. So I'll say this is tension CE and tension of BD. That's what we're after. All right, we're told generally this is an equilibrium and that A is a ball and socket. All right, so for equilibrium, we're going to use our sum of the forces equals zero, sum of the moments equals zero equations. And you'll start to see it can get a little cumbersome in 3D since we have six equations. And it's going to be you know, a little time consuming, but if you track everything correctly, um, it's not too, too bad. All right. So first thing we want to do with these problems is a free body diagram. You should really get in the habit of doing that every single time. Right? And here I'll do my best. Again, I'm not the best artist, but hopefully good enough to just sort of get me by. Right. <clears throat> I'll keep the coordinate system on here just so we're all sort of together. Here's this X. This is Y. And here is Z. All right. So free body diagram. Um, first and probably easy is just putting the weight in here. The weight's going to act in the center of the object for a rectangle it's pretty easy to understand here's is 270 pounds just write it as 270. out here i've got this point b and i've got sort of the force associated with that and if i think about you know isolating this rectangular plate i've got to cut through that cable at b and we know that if we're cutting through a single cable that we only have one reaction force associated in the direction of the cable. So let's just call this T, BD. That force is 2V determined, T, BD. <laughs> well, wow, that's a good one, come on. All right. We also have a point E here on the structure. And we've got a force there. It's uh, something like this. And I'll call this T, C, E. Also unknown, don't really um, know that guy. Now I've got to worry about uh, what's going on at point A. I'm told it's a ball and socket joint. So let me go back to my handy dandy chart and see if ball and socket joint is, is in there. All right, well, here we go. We got ball and socket joint right here, kind of in the, in the middle of the chart. And for a ball and socket joint, you've got three reaction forces that occur that are stopping motion 
in all three general directions, but it allows rotation freely. So no moments at that interface, but there are three reaction forces. So when we sort of isolate our piece and sort of cut through the reaction at A here, we're going to have to accommodate those three reaction forces. So I don't necessarily know what direction they are currently, so I'm going to generally draw them in the positive sense. So let's do that. So here we have the force at A in the X direction. We have the force at A in the Y direction. And in the general positive sense, we have the force at A in the Z direction. And this would be sort of my full and complete free body diagram for this problem. I've counted for all the forces. I've broken everything away appropriately and isolated my piece. And so I'm, I'm sort of ready to tackle this problem now. All right. I've also kind of shown in this free body diagram here that we have five unknowns in this situation. And we know that we have six equations that we can work with. So that's a good sign that we have, you know, less unknowns than we have equations we know we can work with. All right. Now, uh, first thing I might want to do is actually write the tensions in the wires at E and B in terms of their unit vectors along that direction. Since I know I'm going to need to resolve these forces into rectangular components to do things like the moments and the forces in the random directions, X, Y, and Z, I need to write these tensions in terms of the cardinal directions. So what I need is I need something like the force um, CE. Here is something like the tension CE multiplied by the unit vector that exists along that direction. So these unit vectors, they keep coming back. Unit vectors between two points, you got to know how to do this, all right? Coming back over and over and over in this class. All right, so this is going to be TCE multiplied by the unit vector which exists between C and E. So let's apply it as this general unit vector here. Okay. So thinking about going from E to C, um, I can sort of make that unit vector and think about the X direction. I've got to go back six feet, the Y direction. I've got to go up three feet and the Z direction. I've got to go positive two feet. So here, if I want to make my unit vector, I'm going back six in the I. I'm going up three in J and I'm going positive two in K. And I have to normalize all of this by the magnitude of the distance, which here is something like negative six squared plus three squared plus two squared. So I work all this, I can write my force um, emanating from E pointed towards C in terms of the tension T C E, which is something I need to solve for. And then sort of like this magnitude of the unit vector which we could calculate as negative 0.857i. Plus 0.429j. Plus 0.286k. Hey, go away. Hey. OK, so that would be like the components of my unit vector. I could do a very similar thing for the tension that's occurring here at point B. So this force BD is the tension in BD multiplied by the unit vector between B and D. I'll sort of go quickly through this. Here to get from B to D, I've got to go back eight feet in X. I've got to go up four feet in Y, and I've got to go back eight in Z. So here it's going to be something like back eight in X, up four in Y, and then back eight in Z. All this is going to be normalized by the magnitude of this vector. OK. So then my force BD is something like T BD multiplied by the unit vector in the direction of that force. 
negative 0.667 i hat plus 0.333 j hat i know that you can identify this as like two thirds and one third but i just like using the decimals it's a personal choice j hat okay so this would be generally how you would write your force and hopefully you know you've had enough practice with this with 3d particle equilibrium that this is this is pretty quick now all right so now we're actually ready for the new material and that is sort of the equilibrium in 3d and remember i have six equations Okay, and the difficult part about 3D equilibrium problems, in my opinion, is knowing where to start with my six equations, okay? So I've got three moment equations, I've got three force equations, and I have five unknowns. It would be nice if I were able to sort of like select equations that would be the easiest to solve from the get-go, okay? Now let's consider what would happen if I did like some of the forces equal to zero. I go back up to my free body diagram here. If I'm looking at this free body diagram here, okay, if I were gonna do like some of the forces X, some of the forces Y, some of the forces Z, each one of those equations is gonna have like a series of unknown variables, which are sort of annoying, okay? I've got components of TBD in all three directions. I've got components of TCE in all three directions. And then I've got these three forces that are acting at that ball and socket joint. So if I do some of the forces, all of those five variables are going to show up in those three equations. And I'm not going to really be able to whittle it down very easily. So that's kind of annoying. And I don't want to go that route first. A better route might be to consider doing the sum of the moments equal to zero first. And here's why. I know in this particular problem that there are three unknowns that are located generally at point A. This FAX, FAY, and FAZ. So here I am at point A. If I'm strategic and smart about selecting to do the sum of the moments about point A, well then, if I'm just summing the moments about A, I only will have two unknowns which appear for my three equations for the sum of the moments. So that would be a nice and smart selection. If I were to sum the moments about A, I could probably whittle down and figure out pretty quickly what are the tensions in CE and the tensions in BD, because those are only two unknowns that might appear for what I would generally have as three equations. So let's do that. And it's gonna vary from problem to problem. In this specific problem, that's a nice method to choose because if I sum the moments about A, I don't have to worry about what's going on with the forces at A, okay? So let's sum the moments at A equals zero. Okay. Now let's do this. You should have enough practice now doing moments where I can say that the sum of the moments at A is something like, go back to my picture here. Here I am standing at A. I will only have contributions to the moment about A from this tension, this tension, and this weight. Okay. So I will go through this quickly and say that the contribution here, here, and here are pretty easy to see and understand. And I will write them in the most general way. So the moment at A is gonna be something like the position vector arriving at B from A crossed with the force at B, or what we call as FBD, plus the position vector which arrives at E from A crossed with that F CE. Finally, I have the position vector uh, which arrives at the weight. Okay, so let's say it arrives at the weight from A crossed with the actual weight of the piece. All right. So about A, these are the contributing factors. All right. Now let's go ahead and define each one of these things um, and we'll make our way through. We know we've already written that. We know we've already written that. This guy here, pretty easy. If we go back up to our figure, we have 270 pounds, which is just generally in the negative J hat. Okay. 
So this negative 270 J hat pounds. That guy's pretty easy. Right? It's maybe just these position vectors that we have to worry about, and then we'd be ready for our cross product. All right, so let's do it. My position vector, which arrives at B from A. All right, go up to my figure. Arriving at B from A. Well, that's just eight feet and I hat. Okay, pretty easy. <clears throat> my position vector that arrives at E from A. Similarly easy. Here's E, here's A. Arriving at E from A is just six I hat feet. Okay, and then this arriving at the weight from A, uh, you could think of this in a couple of different ways, but let's just go through the, the full bore of it, arriving at W from A. If I think about this acting right in the center, then this would be the position vector arriving at that weight from A. And to get there, I would have to go 4i hat minus 2.5j hat. Okay. So I'm now ready to execute my moment equation. So let's consider each one of these. So here, arriving at B from A, crossed with my force BD. I could set this up in that like determinant form, something like I hat, J hat, K hat. My position vector arriving at B from A is eight and I, zero and J, zero and K feet. And then my FBD, this is, again, I sort of calculated this previously, sort of using unit vector ideas. And this is going to contain an unknown variable, which is TBD. So all the way back up here, we calculated what is this force BD in terms of the components in I, J, and K. So here we have what would be um, negative 0.667. TBD. Here we would have 0.333. TBD and J. And run a little low on room here. But 0.667. Negative 0.667. TBD. K hat. Okay. Ran out of room there a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay, so the contribution to the moment about A is this cross product here. It's the position vector of B arriving at A cross with FBD. All right, so if we go through it, here we get nothing. Here we get nothing. And in K hat, we have something like 8 times 0.333 TBD. All right, so we're going to end up with, this is 2.667 TBD. K hat, and now I've got to do sort of my negative direction. I, zero, okay, that's that. Okay, I will have something in J. It's going to be like negative 0.667 TBD times eight, but I'm going sort of down into the left, so that's a negative contribution. So I'll have here then a plus 5.33 TBD. J hat. And then lastly, here, I've got nothing. Okay, so this is sort of my contribution, which is RBA cross FBD. Same idea for the next part. REA cross FCE.
Same strategy. Okay, position vector arriving at E from A, we already sort of did this. 6i, 0j, 0k. And my force CE, which I found previously, negative 0.857. It's TCE. In J, I have 0.429. TCE, and then in K, 0.286. All right, work through this guy, 2.57. TCE, K hat, minus 1.72. TCE, J hat. Alright. My last part of the equation, position vector arriving at the weight from A crossed with the weight. I will just sort of move quickly through this, um, kind of use my shortcut ideas here. Alright. If the weight is here in the middle of the piece, then the line of action of that weight is sort of this vertical line that looks something like that. And my distance from A to that line of action of the force is four feet. So I can quickly calculate that the moment associated with the weight of this guy is gonna be something like 270 pounds times four feet. And it's gonna be acting in the negative K. You can go through the full cross product if you'd like. Okay, so the contribution here, negative 1080 foot pounds, K hat. All right, so finally, I can put it all together. So I've got the contribution from my position vector BA crossed with FBD, which is here. And K hat. Plus 5.332D J hat. I'm going to add the contribution from that second tension, 2.57 TCE uh, in K hat minus 1.76 TCE in J hat. And Finally, including the contribution of the weight, minus 1080 K hat. This all has to be zero. So finally, here we are. Some of our moments about A, everything sort of accounted for here. <clears throat> all right. Here I've got two unknowns. That's TBD and TCE. And here I generally have two equations, which will be one in K hat and one in J hat. So let's look at those. So in J hat here, we have something like 5.33 minus 1.76 TCE equal to zero. Okay. 
can do some work here to sort of whittle us down and come up with a relationship between BD and CE. And that would be that TBD here is equal to 0.322 TCE. Okay, interesting. So that's one sort of relationship that we have. Now we'll look in the other direction, K hat. So we have 0.2667 TBD and 2.57 TCE. And I can't forget my um, can't forget this guy. Units here, foot pounds. I can make a substitution here. There we are. Finally, after all that, we have whittled this down to one equation, one unknown. And so we're ready, finally, for the value of TCE after you work through all the algebra here, 315 pounds. All that, finally, to get TCE. Then I can go back again and utilize that relationship up there to calculate TBD. Point three two two times TCE. And this will get you the TBD, which is no longer to be determined, 101 pounds. Okay, man, that's a journey. A long journey to get to that, to get to that solution. But we're not done. All right, we've got these tensions in these ropes. That's nice, but really it's only like half the problem. We're all the way up. We had to find TCE and TBD. Okay, but we also need to find the reactions at A, which are these forces here, which we haven't even like discussed yet. And we've done our sum of the moments equations, but we still have our sum of the forces equations left over. So we have to finish off this problem with some of the forces equals zero. All right. All right. So here we are. Some of the forces in X equals zero. I'm going to move through this pretty quick. Hopefully we understand. Um, that those tensions now in those wires can be broken up into their X, Y, and Z components. And so we're going to take components of those tensions of BD and CE along with the reaction forces at A to calculate what those reaction forces actually are. So what I mean by that is here we've got these tensions that we actually know now. And I have unit vectors that allow me to resolve them into various directions. 
and then I can do my sum of the forces to get me through through to the end. OK, so in the X direction, I have this force at A in the X direction. This is my reaction force at A. It's sort of this unknown. Here I'm going to add now what is TBD times um, the contribution of that unit vector in X, which here I know to be negative 0.667. I'm going to add to this the tension in CE multiplied by its contribution in X, which if you sort of go back to the unit vectors, you'll see is a negative 0.857. All this equal to zero. So this here is like lambda CE, the X portion. This here is like lambda the X portion. OK, I know what these values are now. I can plug in here that TBD is uh, 101. And I know that TCE also is 315 pounds. So I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll. So here, this is FAX plus 101 pounds multiplied by negative 0.667 plus 315 pounds multiplied by its contribution in X equal to zero. And I can calculate that the reaction force at A in the X direction here, 337 pounds. I can continue with my other equations. Some of the forces Y is zero. And get that my reaction force at A in the Y direction plus my tension TBD is 101. Multiplied by its con you know, contribution in Y. So if you go back to the unit vector for BD is 0.333. Plus TCE which is 315 pounds, multiplied by its contribution in Y is 0.429. And don't forget the weight of the object here, 270 pounds. This all equals zero. Can work this down. FAY 101.2. 101 Dalmatians. No, 101 pounds. Finally, our journey is almost complete. Some of the forces in Z. My force at A in the Z direction plus the tension in that wire, BD, multiplied by its contribution in Z now, which is negative 0.667, plus TCE is 315, multiplied by its contribution in Z, 0.286. So it has to be zero for an equilibrium. So finally, my force at A in the Z direction. Here's negative 22.7 pounds. OK, man, that was a lot. So you, you see that these 3D equilibrium problems, they can be long and complicated. But I don't know if complicated is the right word. Uh, it's, it's really just a lot of like bookkeeping, OK? you've you know how to calculate moments, you just have to calculate a couple of them. You know how to sum forces, you just got to do it in three directions. Like, it's really not anything more than you've already done. You just really got to be meticulous about the bookkeeping here, all right? Write your tensions in the appropriate unit vectors, make sure that you're calculating those correctly. You're going to start to see, you know, 
little errors in calculations can really be problematic as you're working through these long problems. So be very conscious of that. Right. So that'll be it for today. We'll do uh, another example problem in 3D tomorrow, and you should be uh, should be good to go. So um, thanks for coming. We'll uh, we'll see you tomorrow.